Two of my favourite things about running this channel are number one, getting to interact with some awesome people, and two, learning something new about a subject that I wouldn't have otherwise explored. And in this case, I got to do both, with the subject being the Amanita muscaria mushroom, and the person being a fellow YouTuber who runs a channel, Amanita Dreamer. There's something incredibly iconic about Amanita muscara, with it cropping up everywhere from ancient religious art to modern day video games. And although I was aware of it, it was always kind of off my radar in terms of psychedelics that I was looking to explore. And I don't think I was alone here. This seems to be the common mentality around most modern psychonauts. And I think a big part of that comes from its reputation for being incredibly dangerous or even deadly if prepared incorrectly. But how much truth is in that? And what does this mushroom even feel like? Chemically, it's very different to the psilocybin mushrooms that I'm used to. So what kind of experience does that translate into? The Amanita Dreamer channel goes into great detail about how to find, prepare and experience this iconic teacher. And I've been binging on her content for the last few days and I'm now becoming quite intrigued and I've got a lot of questions for her. The host of the channel also goes by the alias of Amanita and I love this conversation. It just flowed and we were there for about an hour and a half just talking about everything from mental health to sort of pagan rituals. Obviously a lot about the Amanita Muscaria mushroom and I feel like I've learned a lot here. I'm really looking forward to talking to her again at some point in the future. So that's enough often for me and without further ado, I bring you Amanita Dreamer. Yeah. So what, how, how did you come across it? Anyway, how did you get into all this? Because I had, well, I've had panic attacks my whole life and managed to sort of eke it out, you know, without having to get on medication. But after Hurricane Katrina and relocating and then having to file bankruptcy, like it all just got too much. And I wound up having to get on the strongest medication that they have. It's a class of benzodiazepine. And it was a pretty horrid drug. But when you when the alternative is in your corner, crying and unable to move, like, okay, I'll take the drug. But after like five years, I started to notice serious mental deficits. Like I wasn't functioning anymore. And not long after that, a study came out that it caused early onset dementia. And I was like, God, you know, I'm too young to go like this. And then it took another five years of weaning off of that. And anyone can tell you that's ever had to come off of benzodiazepines. That that's a hell that I would never wish on anyone. It was the most God awful thing. And then to have to go back up on it because you're literally dying. Like mm -hmm. it's it's death or the drug. And you're like, okay, I'll go back up on the drug. And then you get settled and you're like, no, I can do this. I can get off this. And it's not like a mental addiction. It is your body physically fighting you. Yeah. So I had gotten to a point where I said, you know what? I can't live with the panic. I can't live on the drug and I can't live coming off the drug. I guess my life is over because I have no more options and existing in any of these three options isn't living. I knew I came here to do more than this and I'm not going to live in this body like that and become a burden to my children yeah. and just take up space, eat food and just exist and be miserable like if my existing was going to cause some good like okay but it wasn't and that's, that's it i'm checking out and i i planned my death and got all of my affairs in order and i s went and saw family they didn't know i was going to do this and i had everything laid out and ready to go and i thought you know what i'll take a walk in the woods and just say my goodbyes and that night was the night i was going to leave the planet and I walked up on this amazingly beautiful, brightly colored mushroom, and I'm like, what the hell is that? And I picked it, I came home and I studied, and I found out that it is a, a GABA agonist, which is how they found the benzodiazepine class of drugs. I'm like, you're kidding. So it was definitely a gift from the forest. And I did my research, and I was like, you know what? If it kills me, hey, it did what I wanted to do anyway. <laughs> There you go, every cloud silver lining. <laughs> yeah, right? And as it happened, it set me free and it gave me a life that I didn't know was possible. So this was something that was like growing in your sort of like, you know, in your backyard then for, for a while. Or it... Yeah, there's some woods down from my house that, that I went walking in. And, and it I walked there all the time and it had never been there before and it hasn't been there since. Uh -huh. Do you think... Uh, was it that you just, you were kind of, because of the state you were in, do you think you just missed it or do you think no, it was I mean, I've, kind of I've been there, I've been there a lot and, and it, I haven't seen any, 
even in season when it's supposed to be there, there haven't been any. But I mean, you can mystical that all you want, or it's just there's there's chemical reasons why it you know happened to have been there. But you know, serendipity is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So once once you once you came across it, and then I guess you didn't have these kind of reservations that I'm I was sort of talking about. Then was it was it just you? Oh no, I did. This? I did, and it wasn't that I didn't care if I died. It's the way I was going to die was going to be pretty horrible, you know. But it turns out that, that the Amanita scare and all that is actually about the deadly Amanitas. Because Amanita is just a genus yeah, with, you know, hundreds of different species in it. And it just so happens that two of those are the two most deadly mushrooms on the planet. So people get them, they hear Amanita and they just lump it all in as one major like mushroom or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but that's even emergency room doctors do that and they're part of the problem. But yeah, I think just in general, people hear Amanita and they know that Varosa and Phalloides are the deadly ones, but I don't think they realize that they're, they're the deadly ones and not all of them are deadly. And then actually one of them or two of them are three of them are muscimol, ibotenic acid, and medicinal, and healing, and good. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a part of it. I think with, particularly with my own perception, because in terms of awareness, like I say, it's so iconic, it, it's kind of out there, but in terms of it's kind of the PR when, of like people who get into psychedelics, there's not many people who like instantly jump to sort of think, you know, Amanita Mascara. I'd say it's very on the fringe of, of at least like the current psychedelic renaissance for want of a, of a better term and so that's what again that's what i kind of find so interesting about your channel i was like oh right yeah there's this thing and it's like it's very it's, it's been kind of like very prominently there and it features in all these skin you know, there's a lot of like christian right? iconography and in particular in, in europe it's like there's a lot of this iconography out there even in this sort of subculture because again it's popping up in video games in japan and stuff like that and it's just never sort of just popped up on my radar to think, well, why not try this? You know, instead I'm, I'm all looking straight away, I'm looking at ayahuasca, I'm looking at psilocybin mushrooms, but never I even just kind of, and I was thinking, why, why, why is this? And the other thing I'll, I'll tell you what, what I really like when I saw your channel is when I was a kid, I was growing up with a lot of comic books and sort of movies, all about this kind of very, pagan sort of like druidistic sort of imagery and i saw that video of you walking like barefoot with these these antlers and oh, the, Im yeah. the imagery was so like awesome it just really took me back to this all, all this kind of very um sort of arthurian sort of <laughs> like you know the, the tribe it's very the, pagan yeah 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 it, I mean, that's definitely the vibe that comes out from from your channel. You know, this it's kind of you, you seem very organic in the woods, all very close to nature. It's cool, man. I love it. I really, I really like the, the sort of the style that you're putting out there. Well, it's weird too because that's not my heritage, and you know, my genetics, whatever they're um, Slovakian and Sicilian. But once I started using the mushroom, I started really feeling this connection to a Nordic past, mm -hmm. which is really weird because I mean, you and I are both very science-based, so I'll analyze the hell out of anything. I mean, put it in front of me, I'll analyze it. And I really have been trying to figure out why over the last year and a half, I'm starting to feel Nordic, even though I don't, I mean, I don't know, I haven't had my DNA tested. I mean, maybe there is some, some Nordic in there, but I am only one generation removed from mm -hmm. Sicily and Czechoslovakia. So it's not like I have like a watered down DNA or anything. So I don't know. And I don't like to limit mushroom mycelium because since I've been on this path, I don't know about you, but I'm learning some crazy shit about mushrooms and mushroom mycelium and how they could possibly be the first alien visitors, you know, and that their spores were found in meteors and mm -hmm. that they've traveled from other planets. And the more I think about consciousness and learn about consciousness, the, and the more dumb i realize the human animal is and how very limited our perceptions are the more i'm beginning to think we're really kind of full of ourselves if we think that what we see is everything and that we're the definition of everything it's really ridiculous because what if we are 
pretty much at the bottom as far as sentience and consciousness and abilities to perceive all of the living things around us because I mean, you know, other animals can geolocate and possibly sense and are aware of, of what's going on in other animal communities or their environment. Like, it makes me think we're some of the dumbest creatures on the planet. So I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't surprise me if mushroom mycelium is able to pull from its environment the animals and the air and the botany and the chemistry around it but also its heritage and its dna going all the way back to create a message mm -hmm. and then they put that message in the fruit and then we take it in and we are actually learning and changing and growing based on what they're creating and putting out there it's just a wild theory i don't know I I can I can relate to that. And th there was there's a bit in another. I was watching one of your trip reports, and I think just with what you just said, I, I think I think maybe the the thing like if the, if we you know if there was like some sort of like purpose to life or some message or something, then maybe it's just to feel joy because I mean you sort of you're right in that humans we're not like the we're not necessarily the smartest. We're not got these kind of natural talents, but what we do do really effectively, perhaps too effectively is feel emotion and i think you know this gets, comes back to what you're saying about anxiety before and and with that you know there's this a balance there between our ability to feel anxieties and sort of you know loneliness but also just to feel this very pure joy and, and i think that's maybe you know if there is any kind of like purpose to our life it's to experience that and i got that from from one of you know i think it was your thousandth subscriber trip report or something and you were talking about you, you got a moment of just feeling like pure sort of joy and I've, I've certainly experienced that and it's and it's a beautiful thing and when you feel it you feel so fucking stupid the rest of the time for like why why did I not just why was I so caught up in my own bullshit right just to, and it's just, so meaningless and silly <laughs> yeah yeah and it, it's you, you kind of realise that there's kind of so many yeah, just so many layers that you just apply to yourself that make you miserable. Um, and yeah, if you could just sort of strip it all away, you could you could just get back to a pure existence. So maybe that's maybe that's what it's all about. I don't know. You know, though, when I was coming back from all of that, coming down from it, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to forget this, though. Like, I'm not going to bring this back with me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to actually remember. And then I did remember but I remembered as a concept, mm -hmm. but not the feeling associated with it. And I thought, yeah, that really sucks. You know, I would really like to be able to just, but you know what I found? And I want to know, like, did this happen to you? At first, it sort of felt like I was depressed because I didn't seem as completely engaged. Like when I see a sale, of something mm -hmm. that I really need and I can get it for half off. I used to freak out, you know, and text people, just take pictures of it. And now I'm like, cool, and I get it. And someone makes a really great meal and it tastes amazing. I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. But I don't like feel overly appreciative. Like what I noticed is everything started to dull. Mm -hmm. And I thought something was wrong and I thought I must be getting depressed or maybe I'm going through a transition and it's just hard to process. And what I realized is that to actually feel contentment and joy in the moment, you have to unplug from the bullshit and it's all bullshit. If it isn't about peace and contentment, it's bullshit, albeit a very pervasive bullshit to quote Einstein, not correctly, but <laughs> it's still bullshit even if it's intense bullshit even if it's extremely painful fearful it's gonna pass which makes it bullshit and then you're just gonna die out of all of it anyway and then what difference did it make so i mean i don't mean to be glib and make light of severely painful issues because there is so much injustice and crazy insanity that humans do to other humans that it's it makes being here difficult 
for anybody, most of us. And my whole purpose is to end suffering as much as I can. It's like, that's why I made the channel. But even my suffering, as great as it was, was bullshit. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't control the physiology, but even in it, I knew it was bullshit. I was like, this is not, this isn't why I'm supposed to be here, which yeah. was why I was suicidal because I just, I was like, this isn't the point of being here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say, when you say like it's, it's, it's fleeting moments and you don't bring it back with you. I, I think I, I get, I always try and think of that is, is that the lesson sort of thing? Cause if, if you're just in some sort of like pure state of like ecstasy or whatever from, from that point of your life onwards and that's kind of equally unearned. And th the way I sort of rationalize it is that I think these things give you a glimpse of something that you could call like your higher power or something that, you, you know, a state that you want to be in, a state that's desirable. And then that's something for you then to then work towards. And it gives you a sense of purpose. It gives you a sense of meaning. And it's not just handing you the answer. It's not, again, it's not the magic bullet kind of thing. And there's a sense of fulfillment as well from then going in that direction. But it does have this, flip side of yeah you can then sort of start feeling depressed because you're not there you know you're, you're, you're now out of the light of heaven sort of thing and you you have to sort of work to get back into it so it's it is a sort of a, a, it can be like a bit of a struggle and i always sort of try and talk to people when, when they're asking me about psychedelics like you've got to be realistic about what this this is not going to fix all your problems overnight so this is you know there's you see a lot of kind of these bullshit sort of news reports like one cup of ayahuasca and your depression's just gone it's like wish <laughs> but yeah and, and and i think maybe that's part of, of like another bit of a, like a pr problem around psychedelics is that people expect too much and so then it, it doesn't allow them to process shit properly if it doesn't go to plan you know if they have a bad experience the first time they're just completely fucked and you, you know, I've, I've seen people absolutely sort of like dying inside but unable to express it because they're just not prepared to have like a bad time you know it's like that they're not prepared to say jesus christ that was a fucking horrible night <laughs> you know that was uh, that was like the worst night of my life because nobody wants that everybody just wants the, the sunshine and rainbows and shit like that well and also if you're whatever brought you to a place where you're seeking mental health wasn't good mm -hmm. and you've been suffering and I think I know for me I was just so tired and I just wanted something to give me relief and so when you hear all these great stories of psychedelics I think you just want relief mm -hmm. and then on top of it to be able to bring that relief back and keep it and I did a video on medical self-reliance mm -hmm. And it, it's this, which is take responsibility. There's no magic fix. There, there are boosts. There are things that are going to accelerate. There are things that are going to shine a light for you on things that were dark. But then you've got to take it home and do the work. But also there's that sense that our own society breeds dependence on the, the construct, the, mm -hmm. the teacher and the judge and the politician and the doctor like we're raised from birth to not take ownership of our entire lives but to put it on other people so that they can do things for us and we don't have to work for knowledge but also so we can blame them when things don't work and i'm not saying it's good or bad or right or wrong it just breeds this sort of place where if if you're broken somebody needs to fix it and that somebody is ourselves, but it, it's sad that that's not our first thought. Yeah. Is that I've got to fix this. Yeah. And I, well, I guess it's not even, in most cases, it's not even that the person you go to isn't going to fix it. They're going to sort of subdue it, mask the, you know, mask the symptoms sort of thing. I'm guessing, you know, that's probably, you know, how you ended up on this sort of, uh, on the benzo as you're talking about. And, and yeah. that, that, the withdrawal that you're talking about, going through, uh, my wife's currently going through uh, the same thing at the moment. Oh, so I, I don't know if it's as, as, as severe as what you uh, going through, but she's, she's described sort of like feeling like she's in, got permanent flu kind of thing. So it's, and the other, I don't know if, you, if you're following, but um, um, and Jordan Peterson, who's a 
I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's currently going through it. All I wish that there was a way to reach out to him and be like, man, this is sitting here. It's freely available. It's You can get it anywhere, and, and you know, it's short. But, you know, he's dealing with his wife's cancer yeah, and yeah. trying to just get his her affairs in order. I can't imagine what he's trying to deal with that on top of, you know, what he... Uh, well, I think that, that's... Know. I think that's a bit where it's kind of understandable where, why sort of people get onto things like like sort of benzos and stuff because there, there are points where you just need to get through that period. You've just got to... Absolutely. You know, they you, definitely you, serve a purpose. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think that's where the kind of the establishment breaks down in that the, the, there's nothing to get you off, really. It's, it's all about, you know, they'll stick you on antidepressants for the rest of your life and... But there's no kind of like, okay, now, now that you're through that bad period, like how are we going to get you back to being you sort of thing? And yeah, they'll not, they'll just keep up in your dose if they need to. And, and I'm, yeah, I'm definitely not against medications. And, you know, I, I mean, I work in the pharmaceutical industry and I'm so I'm not against modern science or medication, but I think there's a failure in the, I don't know, I guess the understanding of, of these, um, these like emotional or mental states to, to sort of get you back, you know, a plan to get you back to being you rather than just getting you at the door of the office for the next six months. You know, they had me on at one point five medications because, you know, this symptom or side effect, Oh, well then this will help with that side effect. And then you get mm -hmm. another, well, this yeah. will help. And it just, it's this, it's a, and I start to understand now the whole concept of a shaman because it was local and they had the energetic space to know all of the people in their community and mm -hmm. and know and understand. So when they came walking through the door, they probably knew, you know, I know what's going on with you. And they can follow up and say, do you drink the tea I gave you? How is this working? I hear that, you know, your kid's doing this. And with the council doing that, you know, this they knew more to ask the right questions. And, and today... When you're driving 30 minutes or an hour to see your position, you're just a number and a name and a piece of paper. And if you don't check the right box, they don't ask the right question. And, and you're, you're, you're a thin line and they have a list of drugs for that line. And if you mm -hmm. move off of that line, then they have another drug for that. And there's no cohesiveness, no web-like connectedness for any of it. And that'll work for some, enough for people to create a cognitive bias to say, it's a great system. See, all these people are winning in mm -hmm. this system. And then the failures are easy to just ignore. And it's, I believe in using both the natural pharmacy and, and modern medicine. But honestly, the more modern medicine keeps failing me and the more I keep filing, finding out of necessity an alternative that works even better with no side effects, I am accidentally now on a natural pharmacy. It wasn't by design and I certainly would go to the hospital if I needed to or see a doctor if I needed to. Mm -hmm. But it just so happens right now I happen to be managing, well, thriving with a natural pharmacy. But I'm my doctor right now. Well, that's awesome. It's, it's awesome that you can do that. I mean, did you have any kind of like, uh, did, you, did you ever like see a shaman or offer some sort of mentor to guide you through this? Or I, you completely self-taught? No, I did this by myself. But yeah, one time I did see a shaman and he turned out to be a freak. But <laughs> that was a big mistake. But I knew enough to be like, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, also in college, I took a lot of pre-med. I was going to be a doctor. And I took a lot of pre-med classes. So, I mean, I knew, I know the science. I know how to read the science and read the studies and understand the claims, which is why I think I didn't walk away from Amanita. Because people were saying things I knew wasn't physiologically possible mm -hmm. or chemically possible or that's not how mushroom biology works. And and because of all the bad information, I think it kept me looking Yeah. until I found the truth. And you know who did it was um, Psyched, Psyched Substance. All right. Yeah. Because he used Amanita because I still wasn't sure. I was like, it's going to kill me. <laughs> it's going to be a horrible death. But yeah, I watched him use it and I'm like, well, that wasn't too bad. I'll try it bottoms up you know so was it the, the first the first one that you found is that the one that you ended up consuming no no i was scared of it and <laughs> I, I i kept it 
uh, on a shelf while I was doing the research. But it turns mm -hmm. out it was just, it popped up ahead of the season. Right. And then the season hit full bloom and they were everywhere. And, those, and so, it's, so the ones that you took then is, is ones you like harvested yourself and so yeah. on. Yeah, I, I don't like to consume anything I didn't ID mm -hmm. myself or, you know, if I can't test it, I think and it would be hard for me. Yeah, still, it's very, I mean, it's it's very bravery. I mean, we, we, we used to get... Uh, That's how desperate I was, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, not going to... say it was brave. It was, it was an act of desperation. Mm -hmm. It really was. Yeah, where, where, where I sort of grew up in England, uh, we used to get sort of uh, magic mushrooms. I'm not sure which, which strain they were, and it was... We just, they just used to sort of pop up in sort of September time, around, around about the sort of time we'd go back to school in, in, in a, for like the beginning of the term. And yeah, you could just go out on the morning and find them all. And, and uh, they'd just be sort of there growing on, on the grass. And I'm kind of a bit nostalgic for that because I don't live in England anymore. And where I, where I do live, there, there aren't any sort of local psych or none that I'm aware of anyway. So I, I, I quite like that idea of having a relationship with the plants that are mm -hmm. around you or, or the, the things that are around you. And I feel like I missed that opportunity now by sort of moving away from England. But I think it's, it's so cool that you have th that relationship. But like I say, when, with the imagery that you put across in this relationship with the forest and with the, the mush that's springing out, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's, 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 and it's so it's, cool that you share it. It's weird too, because in the woods behind my house, when I go walking, I'll find those antlers. Like I've found three now. And when the first one I found, I'm like, Oh my God, that's cool. But the second one I found was its opposite. Mm -hmm. And the, it was like this instinct to put them on my head. Like it just, I think that's a human thing though. It, I don't know. Maybe I'm just crazy, but like I wanted to do that. And, and the more I did it, the more I'm like, Oh, this feels so empowering. Like, I don't know, maybe something the same way children like want to wear capes and stuff and crowns like it's it's cosplay with the natural world. But it's like I could harness the power, you know, of that buck. There's, there's something put to it on I mean, my head. Like, yeah, I mean, when, when, when I, I did a few uh, summer times where I went to, I mean, you know, Stonehenge in England, where they like the sort of big druidic sort of festivals are. And there, you, you can go there once a year, and they have this big. It's when they're having the uh, the summer solstice, and it's like the longest day. And all these druid guys turn up, and they've all got these antlers, kind of. Uh, there is something about that where it's like, I oh, guess it, it's channeling or it's ritual something. I mean, I although, although you know, I think we, you and I would both sort of describe ourselves as like leaning towards you know the science thing, but I do have a strong belief in the power of ritual. And there oh, is yeah. something very ri ritualistic about sort of, you know, donning either a certain piece of clothing or a certain fragrance or, or something or doing some kind of symbolic thing. And yeah, th th that's absolutely sort of silhouette of the antlers is, is just one of those iconic. When things. there's two kinds of rituals, there's the intention. Like I just uploaded a video on creating a meditative tea practice, mm -hmm. and it's a good way to just create a moment of peace you know in the middle of chaos so there's that sort of intentional and then you know traditions and things that come around every year those are taught us and they're so important for writing yourself if you're just going too far out in left field and something needs to bring you back I think that that's it's my opinion tradition does that it it grounds you and says hey remember who you are where you're from that there's something bigger here that we are a community, that there are seasons. There's just, it sort of reminds you to just get back in pace and breathe. But then like, there's these rituals that sort of come from within organically, like those antlers and just automatically being like, oh, and other rituals like looking up at a full moon. Like it just, there's, there's things that I feel drawn to do. When I go to the beach, I want to run headlong into the water. Mm -hmm. There's just things around us, I think, that like dancing around a fire. I'm currently building a really big fire ring. I'm sort of like logging it on my channel here and there. But this fall, I want to have a big drum circle. And that's in our DNA. Yeah. I think that goes way back in our DNA. Yeah, for sure. I think I mean, that's 
that's what I was thinking about. You know, I, I, I just did this this video recently where I was I was talking about the, this trip I'd had where I was feeling this like, sort of like loneliness and abandonment and also uh, talking about not being able to cry or show emotion, particularly in sort of in the face of, of lost ones. And I, it kind of occurred to me a bit afterwards, like maybe that's something because our current, the rituals that we have in our modern life I kind of failing as like, I personally, I, I don't feel like a funeral does anything. I don't connect to that. And it's not out of disrespect to the person who's lost. And it's not, but it it's so impersonal. It doesn't mean that that standing around wearing a suit doesn't mean anything to me. And, you know, and, and again, I, and if anything, it just made me feel alien because I'm stood there and my, somebody's died and you want to express something but if you know, it's just not right. It just it's just not the right place for it. And I think that's something that we've lost in modern times. It's just is this something about ritual and the that the, yeah the kind of modern rituals just suck, <laughs> and and we need to sort of maybe I think that's why it's good to inherit some of some of the, the other ones. You know, like I sort of inherited sort of, you know, some of like the ayahuasca traditions and that works for me because I didn't have my own tradition. So I'm borrowing from some from some other culture. But like what you just described of, you know, just having a fire. I mean, every you know, who does not love a fire? You know, you sort of, you do it, there's something primal, you get the fire going and you sort of, and you, you, you know, as you're watching that fire and it's like, you know, day turns to night and they see the sparks up, there's no, there's no hierarchy to a fire. It's like every fire is as good as every other fire. And when you look at it, you know, there's not, it doesn't matter if you're the queen of England or the, you know, the president of the USA, the fire is only as good as the fire. It's like, you, you, you know what I mean? There's no, you, you can't go and buy the gold plated fire. It's still a fire. <laughs> like, and I think it's one of those things where even the simplest fire is like better than the sort of the, the more arranged ones. But then that's, I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling a bit now. But that's No, like a, that's it, actually really amazing and beautiful. I've never thought of a fire like that. And I was going to say our rituals have been co-opted by corporations so that they're about gathering material goods every single freaking season. Mm -hmm. Every tradition now is about corporations and buying. And... I was thinking that when you said that about fire, I'm like, yeah, because we're always, oh, I got to get a better wreath. I got to get a better tree, a, you know, better Easter basket. It just, mm -hmm. it's always, I got to get better. And a fire has no hierarchy. Like that should be on a, on the wall. <laughs> Is it that me? That's very deep. That means a lot. Well, that, that's what it came to me. It was one when I was on one of my ayahuasca retreats and yeah, I just found myself that I was I was just sat around on just looking at a campfire and I, and I was perfectly content to be there for any any number. Of, there was been nowhere I would have rather been at that moment than just just sat around that fire doing absolutely fuck all. Just I just sat there. It's like you hear that, you know, the crackle and the spirit and you're just there with your friends. And it's like, yeah, Jesus Christ, is this does it is this not it? Is this not? what we were striving for this, this fleeting moment of peace. I would, it's, it's, this is kind of it, isn't it? Like there was, I can't even remember. I, I listened to a podcast so long ago and they talked about the fact that fire could be considered a psychedelic mm -hmm. that if you are just completely clean, if you stare at a fire long enough, you'll start hallucinating. Like I, I don't know. But I know that I have tried and it wasn't on purpose. We we're in the middle of nowhere and it was a fire. And instead of talking, I decided to stare at the fire. And you do start to sort of time distort mm -hmm. and see things and, and start to feel sort of like a hallucinatory floaty thing. Like, I don't know if it what's happening physiologically, but I also wonder if we haven't been doped for thousands of years of our ancestors doing psychedelics and hallucinogens around a fire that it incorporates that. And so it's sort of like on an epigenetic level, we are altering our DNA over all of those millennia so that now 
instead of those things inducing it, the fire induces it. I think Does that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was listening to a, a TED talk recently, and it was talking about sort of global shamanism, and you know, each sort of culture has their own ways of you know introducing sort of trance states or this, you know. So you've got you've got the you know the cultures that take like a psychoactive substance, but then you've got others which are not based around a psychoactive substance at all. So you know, the typical ones being. Um, uh, like drum, uh, dancing sort of ceremony. You know, yeah. where you dance yourself to some point of exhaustion, or and there was one culture. I think it was based in sort of near Siberia somewhere, where the the, the shamanistic trans state. It was that they burnt. They, they made a big campfire, and then sacrificed a, an, an animal, and they would pour its blood over the the fire, and that's what would induce the sort of trans state. And again, I don't, you don't know where, whether that's real or whether it's a bit sort of kooky but I, I thought it was very interesting and and, I've, and you certainly i've seen enough reports of people doing things like sun dances or you know sweat lodges or that and, and inducing states that way so i don't i'm not opposed to the idea of it coming about by some other way other than by psychoactive means and it's just i, I do believe that there's it is something in us that's i mean basically even, even with the psychoactive thing we're still talking about it. It's a chemical switch. It's doing. Your brain is capable of doing that, and it's just the chemical switch has been triggered to, you know, to allow you to do it. But sure, you know, you talk, you hear about people sitting in caves and doing it, or doing some kind of intense yoga, and I don't see that that's impossible. So I mean, yeah, and I think I think fire is one of those, you know, fire like you say, run it, run into the ocean. I, I I cannot be at an ocean and not at least stick my feet in the ocean. It's like I've got to, if if I if I see the sea, I've got to put my feet in it. It's just one of the things, and I feel so. I mean, I just I just, I just look so English <laughs> doing it with my rolled up pants and my <laughs> white feet poking out, it's like like the most yeah the most English guy anywhere. But it's, I love it. I love it, and it's it does trigger some sort of state of bliss, very subtle bliss, but still bliss. And I, I think, yeah, things like that and campfires. I think and these bare, are things that... and being barefoot in the dirt. Like if I don't get my bare feet in the, excuse me, in the dirt, I don't know. After a couple of days, like that's a craving. Like I have to go outside and dig through the leaves and get my feet in the dirt. And so every imagery in that video was just me being me. And I think that we get taught to forget about our bare feet on the ground but it's something i can't live without i think it's more you get taught to be ashamed of your burpee on the ground because if somebody if if you were transplanted instantly into some other environment you would be ridiculed for like like, like where's your shoes what the fuck's wrong you know do, do you need yeah. some shoes you know and it's right so it, it's what what is that when my daughter was little you know she couldn't i couldn't keep her in shoes and i'd get to the store and one shoe would just be gone and so we'd go in the store and she'd have one shoe on, one off, and we'd get weird looks, you know. Like, <laughs> You're a horrible mother. <laughs> She'll be all right, I think. But that's the thing. And then maybe that's that's why maybe that we like beaches so much, because it gives you this license just to whip your shoes off, you know, and then and then nobody judges you for it. In fact, it's it's the norm. And you know, when my mom had cancer, she's fine. But when she was in treatment, her doctor actually told her that she needed to take her shoes off and go stand outside in the grass for 20 minutes every day. Well, I mean, that's fucking good advice from her. From yeah, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Well, yeah, Can I, I ask you a question? Of course. What do you think between psilocybin and ayahuasca, you know how everyone, well, people tend to be reductive and they want to say which one's better. Like, <clears throat> I don't think that's a question, but what do you think about the roles each one plays for you? Yeah, I, I, if you'd have asked me this question like two weeks ago, I probably would have given you a different answer. But after what happened to me at the weekend, I'd, <laughs> I'm going to say something, something slightly different. So my initial thought would, was that psilocybin was very fun and very you know i don't and i don't mean this dismissively but recreational it was very awesome it made me feel like a human being it made me feel joy it it made me feel that awe and wonder at at the universe so i call it like recreational and awesome but i really i i, th I see that as like 
a very healing and healthy thing because sometimes you just need that sort of like god this world really is like just fucking awesome i had forgotten how awesome things were and that's how i saw psilocybin it was always something i did with my wife and it was very it was just like a super fun time and then this thing happened this weekend and it just wiped my wiped the flow with me and ayahuasca i'd always seen as an ordeal it's something i put myself through and it would be a much typically be a much darker experience i've certainly had some i've had some very light and amazing experiences on ayahuasca but they are the exception rather than the norm the norm is usually um fairly dark fairly intense um but with a relieving feeling with a relief and a sort of a purgative aspect so i don't i'd always put them into the category for like ayahuasca for healing sort of psilocybin just to reset myself and to cut through the bullshit that that was the distinction i made and then i had this this experience at the weekend which pretty much flipped that paradigm and it was yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure if i'd even try and put them in separate categories at the moment anymore it was i get it it was just just what i needed at the time and uh yeah it sort of it, it made i'm st- I'm looking to do another ayahuasca retreat as soon as all as, as all these pandemic shits over and I can get some flights. Um, I like the idea of going on retreat and separating myself off and focusing on me. Um, and whereas mushrooms is something I, I sort of do in, in my own home and it's you know I don't have to travel away for it or anything. Doing you know, you don't have to do any particularly huge diets for it or anything like that. So I don't know. I did. I, I definitely. I would not say one is better than the other. I think they are both equally good in different ways. I think that the the bundle of rituals that comes with ayahuasca can be extremely useful to somebody who has none. And I am very grateful to that. And I think having experienced that now, it's given me a, it's given me a container that I could then. It certainly helped me on 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 Friday with my mushroom trip because. I think like 10 years ago, if I'd have had that mushroom trip, I would have been like, fuck this, this sucks. What the, f- <laughs> this, you know, pass me, pass me the trip killers, pass me the benzos, pass me, this, this fucking sucks. And, uh, and I never want to talk about this again. <laughs> but it sort of, it gave me that framework to be able to like, think like, what, what is going on here? And it's, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm still processing it, but it's, it's, I don't think I could have done that without that sort of imported set of rituals from ayahuasca so i don't know i don't know dude it's um i'm yeah i i, I think I, I would need a ritual for i i haven't done any of those yet you know because they're illegal here and i haven't flown anywhere but i mean i'm so terrified of ayahuasca that i would need the ritual it seems like it pulls you in and says don't worry we've done this before <laughs> like you're not the first person and it's i would think that those rituals help calm you and help sort of make you part of something bigger so that you feel sort of like you're just a seat on a bus like we're all in this together we've all been here before mm-hmm. like you're 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 cool we've got That's- this there's definitely a, there's that element to it. There's, I mean, the, the the feeling of sort of taking part in something, ex, you know, it feels extremely um, ancient and extremely guided. And it's also, you, you kind of, you, you are surrendering to a process that is bigger than you. So you end up in, you know, in the middle of the jungle or wherever, and you just, you, uh, I mean, it, it sort of hit me. I was like, "What the fuck am I doing here?" I'm like, and <laughs> that's, that's, "See, that's what I would be like." I'm like, "Oh my, what am I done?" Yeah, yeah. Insane. But by that point, you're screwed. You're in there anyway, <laughs> so you've got to go with it, and it and it it pulls you through it, whether you like it or not, and you have to go through. And honestly, like, I have had unbelievably profound experiences, which, again, ten years ago, I would have been sat there saying calling myself like full of shit like you're like what the fuck I'd be like, what has happened to you man you turned into some goddamn hippie but uh, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, we, I, I've, I've become a goddamn hippie. <laughs> I've given up. Like I'm, I'm that, I'm that girl. You just, you just got to go with it now. It's but, that's it. Get the patchouli oil. Just get the, you know. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, it's the the ritual element just pulls you through something, and that's that's what I mean. It it it, it gives you a framework you don't you wouldn't have, and I think that's when I. I I see, I look back on like my own use of psychedelics previously. I've been doing them, you know, for like, since I was like a, a teenager now. So it's been like a good 25 years. And I just didn't have the framework at first. I, it was, I was looking for, a, you know, a good time. I was looking to get high and I, I wasn't getting any sort of kind of benefit from them other than, you know, the social sort of lubricants that they were providing at the time. Um, but no, yeah, um, I would definitely recommend uh, an ayahuasca tree. If um, it is scary, it is, um, it, it's it's an ass kicker. But it's de- I would say it's one it's one to check out. It's uh, and you know I'm, I think like I said I think I'm going to probably be heading to one at some point. So if you want you know if you want to come and join me in. in well, if in, I in the did, jungle. I would need someone like you to be like, oh, my God, is this okay? Oh, my God, is this right? <laughs> I'd, be like, next, I'd be next to you, like, going, is this okay? Is this right? <laughs> <laughs> the blind leading the blind. I think, though, that that's part of why, and I actually um, made a video on why do people complicate Amanita, because it's the only thing that I've seen that the directions for its use are so simple. And yet everyone comes up with all these wild, crazy, convoluted things to do to it, to use it. And then they create all these different difficulties. And in doing that, they wind up making themselves sick because they didn't decarb it. And it's like, look, just stick to the program. It's real simple. It's it's one, two, three. Do those three things. You're going to be great. And then, but what if I, but what if I, and I get messaged every day. I mean, all of my messages are well, I did this instead, or I followed your directions, I did this, and then those things are nothing like the directions that I give. And I was actually thinking, like, why, why, why? And it's because there's something so ancient about it. There's something so awesome about when you see it in the ground that's hard to describe, the emotion, that it almost seems sacrilegious to pick it and throw it in your car, take it home and throw it in a pan. Like it just feels wrong. You want, you want to worship it, thank it, hold it in regard and do something ceremoniously worthy Mm -hmm. in some way. And that's the frustrating part because I know our ancestors did. What did they do? Because the use of it is so simple. But I know if it does this to me and the other people that find me, they say, oh, my God, it made me feel the same way when I, I had to bring it home. And that's how I found your channel. Like, and on our forum, I have a forum and we talk about this. There's just there's a thing about it when you see it. And I think that's why it's so iconic and in our culture. And it's Mario's mushroom, which, by the way, I thought was a made up thing. I didn't know it was a real thing. And it's in our our icon in our phone, you know, it, it's the Amanita. And even people that don't even know what it is, like on Instagram, you know, I follow the Amanita Muscaria hashtag. So every day there's different artists putting it in their art and they have no idea what it really is. Yeah. It's We're drawn to it because we're supposed to be, because it works on a major neurotransmitter in our brain and it keeps us level-headed and sane to balance the fear response that is integral to our survival that can get out of hand. So there's just the symbiosis in, in the natural world where we need to be fearful. And then this mushroom helps balance it. So I think because it just does so much for us, but it's also got a lot of medicinal qualities too. But I think because it's just so important and so beautiful and we have such an amazing reaction to it and we want to worship it and thank it and dance around it and celebrate it that i think that's why people complicate it and it makes me i feel this emptiness because i want to do something i want to do 
and and so my videos of me foraging, I look like a crazy person. I'm like, oh my god, I'm oh, freaking awesome. out. And, it, and I and it's that it's that sense of reverence, and yeah, yeah. and that sense of community with them, like they're family. And I sound insane, but I swear it. Once you find them and pick them, it, it's like, yeah, I get that. So then to just dry them in a dehydrator and stick them in a jar and then throw them in a pan, it's like, God, ouch. Like, no, no, we can do better, you know? But like, what is that? And our ancestors did. They, so I think, I think I need to create a ritual. I, I'm glad we had this conversation. I think that's what's been missing. I need, I need to create a ritual. Yeah, I think that, that would be a, a cool thing to, to, to build your own thing around it. But just coming back to what you're saying about sort of, you know, the stuff where it's um, like artists using it and not sort of knowing why. And, you know, I, I've seen all, there's a lot of like religious art where <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's in there and you, nobody ever saw it. And it's, it's the same with the Super Mario thing. It's, it's like, it's so iconic that we've almost ignored it. It's, it's like, it's, it, it's, Hidden all, if, you look, if you look for it, it's all over the place. And, you know, and, like I, I went, went to, all, all the schools in England are all like sort of religious. You have, you have to go to like, I do a lot of church stuff. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of religious um, pictures and stained glass windows and stuff that I suppose that had this mushroom in there. And I, I just never clocked it at all. And then like one of my friends like pointed out, hey, do you remember, do you remember that window at, at, at church? It was like, and he showed me a picture. It's like, holy shit, was that there oh all the time? God. And, and then, you yeah. can tell some of them are psilocybin. The way they're growing, they're in yeah. clusters, you know, mm -hmm. and you can tell that they were psilocybins, and then some are clearly Amanita. Like, oh my god! And there's um, what was the book the about the? Oh, I can't think of the name of it. We've got it on our forum. It's easy to find if you just Google Amanita and religious or religion, like all of the connections to Christianity, like popes. Yeah. yeah. The the robe that they wear, and it has what looks like. The skirt of the Amanita and then the red that they wear with all the dots on it and everything. I gotta fly. The dots on it and everything. Like you can tell they're dressing up like the Amanita. And people dress up like the Amanita. Like there's several videos I've seen on YouTube with people that have costumes. And then Shreemy Schmatty, I talk about him. He's got a cool hat. Mm -hmm. Like if I could, I would. If I could sew, I would make a cool Amanita costume. <laughs> like dress up like it. So of course they did. Like yeah, why they, would they? The, sy the symbiosis, I think, is. is been there for for ages and just like what you said at the beginning about you know you, you feeling this pull or this this call to sort of like nordic -y stuff i think yeah i i think there is something there i i'm not sure like i've not really fleshed my thoughts out on on this but there is something like ancestral in these kind of substances there's something where you feel you know connected to to sort of your past and through your sort of lineage and yeah, you know, maybe some of that sort of points back to sort of, you know, with yourself, with your European ancestry. And, you know, eventually we all sort of pointed back somewhere in sort of Africa. I've certainly had experiences where I was like just looking at my hand against the sort of the sky. And I was thinking at some point, like the first human being ever thought, shit, this is my hand. You know, this is a hand. I am a human being. This is this is like I am the start of something, you know, there, there must, there must have been a first conscious thought somewhere in our species. And I, I had that like moment when I was like high as fuck. And I was like, Oh wow, oh my God, this is profound. <laughs> I am the first. And then, you know, you're not, but like, and it's weird having a channel. This is the weirdest thing. Having a channel about this mushroom feels wrong because I'm pontificating on something I don't know shit about. Mm -hmm. Like, who the fuck am I? And then I feel the ancestors. I feel the mushroom. I feel the voice of it. I feel the, the lineage of it. And there are so many greater than me that what, who, like, how dare I? And at the same time, it's like, but, but who's doing this? Nobody's, talking about it and, it and it needs to be discussed and I just wanted to start the conversation mm -hmm. and then at the same time it seems like I was a good a good choice because there's the lore and then there's the science of it which seems to have been just lost 
And then the shaman, they knew, they may not have known the actual names of the, of the enzymes and the chemicals, but they knew the physiology and the, and the medicine of it. And any one of them would be able to speak about this. But there were so many different shaman, you know, there's the Sami and then there's the Czech mm -hmm. that, that are my lineage. There's the Nordic. And then there's even all of the Americas, like they're prolific in Chile and, mm -hmm. uh, and around the, the equatorial areas that, that we wouldn't think they would be. And then on down into South America, which right now it's summer, so it's their fall and they're getting massive flushes. So, you know, they also have to have rituals with it. It's just so weird to know what I know and feel so connected and feel my ancestors in a way that I never even knew was possible. And at the same time, feel completely inept and just completely ignorant. Well, I think that then the, the sort of, you know, you say like, you know, who, who the fuck am I to sort of talk about this thing? Or, or, but it's, that's, it would be kind of like a waste or a criminal. Like, who the fuck are you to not talk about this thing? Is this not your like responsibility to you know to do what you can? And and I think you know this is this is something like where you know I've, I've had like you know messages through my YouTube channel and people are saying oh you know you, you know thank you for saying this you're so brave or whatever and I'm I'm always thinking the same as you like I'm I'm not brave I'm just fucking some. <laughs> douche just i'm just running my mouth just like no and but maybe that's my talent my talent is that i'm not afraid to run my mouth so maybe okay and i think what it what it's the kind of it's the duty i don't know not to be too sort of like preachy about it but it's the duty of like people like ourselves to try and just like normalize this conversation and to sort of put it out there and we, we can sort of talk about it in a sort of a, a human normal way about uh you know shit we were just some people who had you know we had anxiety and we we're looking for some some problems and this works man it just works and i'm not some fucking complete lunatic who's, who's you know talking about quantum mysticism and you know although we or, should and we could oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that and, would and be that, fun and that's, that's the thing <laughs> that stuff's fun yeah but and, and you know and i, I think those kind of ideas can be, you know, you can talk about the front. They're super fun as concepts and stuff. But it, again, it's, and you know, this is why I, I kind of speak out against some guys because then it, it takes away from the the realness of the actual thing. If if you just live in that space, if you if you're completely over over there, and it's, and then you're sort of trying to explain why the universe is run by cyborgs from you know the planet breeble box seven or something then as though it's like absolute fact it's like all right okay dude now we all look stupid uh. but you know what i just thought about this like and i'm guilty of it i i came into this saying okay look y'all whatever the lore is the lore but you're gonna get hurt and shaman didn't know everything but science we have science on this mushroom and science will keep you from getting sick and wasting your time or losing your product because you're not drying it right or whatever and you don't have to argue and get on forums it's really simple science and then every time i use it i want to analyze it through, through the lens of science and then when i get a mystical feeling and when i feel my ancestors and when i met the entities there's three entities in this mushroom i'm like okay and i watched one of your videos where you were talking about the entities and it, you know, it's, my mind can create this. It can create dreams and, you know, DMT can create this and the things that it creates when you're dying, you know, and so my mind is creating these entities and yet everyone who does it sees some of the same imagery and the same mm -hmm. entities, even though they have completely different life experiences. And I wanted to analyze it and my brain kept wanting to analyze it. And just now it occurred to me when you were talking about, you know, well, I sound like, I thought, you know, it does need to be normalized that we don't have to pick and choose. I'm a mysticist, magical thinker, and I'm going to mystify everything and deny science, or I'm going to rationalize everything and make it make sense and figure this shit out. Mm -hmm. Like that's fun. And this is cool. But why, why are they two separate camps? Mm -hmm. Like, why can't I be the science person? who's bringing some sanity to this mushroom in a healthy way that also just runs with the mystical experiences. 
without yeah, excuses yeah. and apologies. Yeah, it's, does it's, that it's, take away from my intelligence? Like, no, not at all. And I, I think it comes back to what we're talking about at the beginning, where it's this, you know, human sort of thinking that we that they're sort of super intelligent, but really we're super dumb. We 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 kind of we're super dumb because we overanalyze that exact situation <laughs> you just said. And if we just if we could just accept that balance of we have there is something within us that wants to know and wants to and like thirsts for explanations and that is a beautiful thing and there is something in us that's just like imagination and joy and just wants to be you know the, the kid you know camping in the fields forever you know it's and you know and, and you, could, you can put like a bazillion labels on stuff like that you could you know and I, like you, you could, could say, you know, something like spirituality, and then some guys will say, "Well, spirituality is bullshit." And like, I mean, it's not. There is a feeling that is spiritually desirable. You don't have to believe in fluffy bearded dudes in the clouds, but you know, you you can get it from sex. You know, you can get it from from you know. There, there is a feeling of spiritual fulfillment, and it's you can't science it, and that's fine. And just. And you can have that and also have the science and and there's a there's a clash there which I'm not sure is is there and the clash only comes up when one starts it if science says that spirituality is complete bullshit, that's the clash. And I'd say science has got no business saying that. And if spirituality starts saying that I can fucking, you know, teleport that you know, <laughs> I I have a brain that doesn't exist and all this is just I'm just imagining it all and then that's bullshit and it's we, I think we can have both. I don't think they're exclusive. Um, and I think if you have, you can have both and be super fulfilled. And I think it's just, the, it, it's the extremists going too much in, in either direction that are, that are fucking things up. Like, I mean, the, 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 a good example is, um, you know, the, uh, the James Cook interviewer, uh, I sent you, I mean, th this is a guy of, who is by all definition, a scientist. He is a sort of neuroscientist and he is super spiritual and, he looks like he's having a fucking great time. <laughs> right? Like, you know, and, and all. I have mad respect for that too. His channel's great. I love that interview you did with him, and and I, it was so refreshing. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But that's what I mean. This this is our. I think with guys like James and you know a few other people spiritually, and I think with yourself, the, the, if there is a mission, then I think this is it. It's to, like I say, normalize this conversation. Just. Talk about talk about the benefits. Talk about the beauty. Talk about the experiences, and but get on with being a human being as, as while we're at it. You know, and that's why I, I hate all this all this stuff about um, like the you know the only thing you've got to do in life is 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 become enlightened and realize <laughs> that you're God or whatever. It's like what what about how does that help me? You know, like tickle my kid's belly. Like what you know if I'm sat there in a cave, stir you know about being enlightenment then you know how am i going to be playing with my cat i don't even have a cat right now but i miss my cat <laughs> but you know like, like there's how is that going to help you you know grow a better crop and you know find a flower that smells amazing or make a know, better brew of tea like or, or make a better campfire <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm so inspired now i've been kind of in a lull with my fire ring and i really need to work i want to see it you need to, you need to you need to Get to it and send some, well, send some I have pixels. another um, channel. Amanita Dreamer is my current channel, but they're sort of shadow banning me and they've already blocked a couple of videos and stuff. So I made another channel just mm -hmm. where I'm putting sort of like my backyard, which is just an ongoing saga, but my fire ring and updates on it and my garden and just stuff like that. Just kind of like a placeholder in case they take all my videos down, but I'm putting them on bit shoot, mm -hmm. like me using on camera, like actively smoking Amanita on camera, stuff like that's on bit shoot. Because mm -hmm. you two got rid of that shit real quick. Yeah, this. I mean, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a funny shot. Like, I, I'm, I'm one of those. Like, I'm constantly checking my like sort of YouTube, thinking like, is is you won't be surprised if you know if it's just missing one day. You yeah. know, you're like, gonna, I didn't want to ask you actually. Like, how have you, how do you get on with it? Just in terms of being a creator and having this kind of voice and you know sort of moderating like the reaction that you get 
in terms of like your own sort of ego and stuff and not letting that sort of pull you under? Is that something you struggle with? Because I really fucking struggle, okay. <laughs> struggle with it, to be honest. No, because I come from such a strong history of self-hate that and a lot of autistic people do because we're just so weird from the get-go. Like we can't do anything right. We're wrong, wrong, wrong. And we can't fix it because it's who we are. So when you just grow up being told how broken you are, like I just, which has probably fueled a lot of my, my suicidal ideation, you know, like when you just don't deserve to be here anymore, like there's no point in being here. That's a pretty serious self-hate actively trying to die position. I don't think I would ever have an ego invested issue. I think it would just be counter to everything that's been programmed in me. Mm -hmm. If anything, if this channel did well and I wound up like speaking on some bigger, I think I wouldn't be able to do it. I think it would freak me out. I don't like when people talk about me being a modern shaman or a guru or I will follow you to the ends of the earth. I'm like, oh, no, no, please don't. Yeah, you got, you got me, <laughs> please you got me don't. <laughs> don't do that. But at the same time, like I want a community. Mm -hmm. I just want to be the voice. I just want to start the conversation where I would get off is watching everyone talk amongst themselves. You know, like that's why I've got the forum and I'm hammering that forum. Like I get on there. That's what I get off on is logging onto the forum and reading the conversations going, look at it, look at it. Mm -hmm. Like they're talking. So I don't know if that's the nurturing mom or something. I don't know. It could be, but, but it's, it's, it's a cool thing and it's, yeah, I think it's it's especially cool just to be able to, to have these kind of platforms and be able to sort of connect with people like yourselves and have sort of like light minded voices. I mean, it, it, it's it's a golden age. This is it is absolutely a golden age. I think what we're living in, even with all the shit going on in the world, then I think there's something in, inherently optimistic about sort of our species and where things are. I'm, I'm, I don't sort of subscribe to this like we're all completely fucked. I think it's really. I, I, yeah, I think that I've got a, a, I feel a lot of sort of um, optimism about sort of the way things are going. I, I think, I mean, clearly there's there's some stuff that's going on that's completely fucked, but I don't feel like the as a species we're doomed or anything like that. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think there's definitely some growing pains to go through, but. Uh, so you don't ascribe to the we're all a virus and we need to go. I'm I, I'm. I think that we're, uh, I think we've got some behaviors that need to go. I'll put it, I'll put it that way. And I think, I think a bit of a cull wouldn't go amiss. I was like firmly on the side of Thanos in the Avengers. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I see some stuff, you know, like I, like I watch like the, like the, the SpaceX kind of launches and stuff like that. And I can't help but think like, fucking why that's pretty awesome. You know, right? like what the heck? hell are we like, yeah, yeah. where did we come from and why are we doing how could we possibly like you look right. at all the other animals and they seem content to be doing what they're doing and they're doing amazing beautiful things just existing and then we come along and we're like nope not good enough we're gonna go to another planet <laughs> well like, i don't know we, we, you, 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 i mean you, you do you, there is that part of animals where they content what they're doing but then i was talking to my wife the other day about like like you know something like cordyceps you know like which you know like what's going on there that's like the most one of the most like brutal you know you, you look at some of these like parasitic or these like symbiotic well yeah like awful symbiotic relationships between some animals i mean it's it's one thing to look at you know simba up on pride rock sort of nobly staring out over the savannah but then yeah there's, there's some sort of on other places like ringworms eating out somebody's you know intestines or something so there's plenty of brutality on this planet and i think we're, we're just as capable as any other species but um, that, that sort of spark, that sort of, that, that, that can capture our imaginations. I mean, you know, but staying with the space scene, one, one of the things that's like burned into my head from, from being a kid was watching, um, the very first space shuttle launch. I think, you know, I, I watched that and my, my sort of grandfather said to me, like, this, this means something, this is something special. And it stuck in my head and I watched this like amazing piece of technology take off in like 1984 or something or whatever, 86 or something. And, uh, yeah. And, it, and that's kind of stays with me since then. And, and I feel, I still feel the optimism, like we can do something. You can get ourselves at this and you don't know how much of what's, what's being reported to is just sort of like overhyped in the media to make people feel shit. Cause there is negativity does pull people in very easily. So yeah, I, I think, 
I think we can do this. And I think maybe psychedelics are part of that picture. And I think, yeah, maybe it's, maybe that's a job of, of dudes like you and me to sort of, like I say, help, help get that out there and, I don't know, help snap people out. They've been a part of us evolving, you know, when you listen to Stamets, you know, and he talks about how he believes, you know, they've been such an integral part of our evolution. And I think we have evolved so rapidly with the technology age that we need help. Like this is a lot to process. This is so much change so fast. And I think that it's why we have so much mental sickness just the sheer anxiety of things shifting and changing so rapidly for us that I think entheogens are the bridge to get us from there to there. Yeah. And I think, you know, from the past to the future. And I think that entheogens are definitely the thing that are going to help bridge that gap in mentally, but also bridge the gap between tradition and science. Mm-hmm. Because it's it, we need that gray. We need the blending of both. Yeah, and you need that. I think it's it's the the loss of meaning. I think that's come as well in this kind of modern age. That's what's by having everything provided very easily, then that's the the sort of the meaning of things has gone away. And I think that's what you get from these substances is that kind of feeling of childlike wonder of you know what i talked about with with psilocybin of just like sometimes you just need to feel awesome sometimes you just need to look at the sky and think holy shit this is amazing like i i cannot believe i've just been looking at the floor for the last like three <laughs> years but i just you know right now i look at the i look at the fire and i look at the skies and i get my I dig my toes into the grass and you know fuck me if this isn't the, the best moment of my life and it's you just need it. It sounds so obvious and so stupid. And like, you know, I wish I could just, you know, I, I, I've got two kids. I wish I'm going to make myself sound like awful now, but I, I should just be able to just curl up with my kids and, and just feel ultimate contentment. And I do when I remember to do it, but I don't remember to do it often enough. And I get lost in my own bullshit to just remember to sort of, yeah, just like, why, why shouldn't I just sit there and just like be, be like looking at my kids like fuck me there you're just amazing you know like I, did, did I yeah. tell you enough how amazing you are children <laughs> like, but yeah I, it's I, I a think return that... to innocence it's a return not to your innocence which it is back when you were innocent of the sins of whatever people are accusing you of and then you accuse yourself of but also to the innocence of everything, because it's so easy to pick out what's wrong with every construct. Yeah, a, a return to you, awe as well. I think, like a, that, that. Yeah. You know that that. As an adult, there are very, there's very few times where you can say like you felt awe, as in like the literal definition of awe. You feel it a lot as a kid because everything's kind of new and novel to you, so you get you feel this a lot, but. And, and that's not. And, the, and the, the weird thing is that we say awesome a lot, and very little actually is. You know, it's like you know, you could. I remember seeing like a sort of like an Eddie Izzard sketch where he's talking about like awesome hot dogs. It's like oh, really like a hot dog is awesome. Like <laughs> that's, you know, that's just, like you know, awesome should be like the celestial heavens opened above you and stuff. But it's a, it's a hot dog now. Is that's how we use the word awesome? So it's, and I think that's the, that's what we we get this kind of this reinvigoration like oh wait this is awe and humility and like you say innocence and joy like joy and bliss like how often do you feel jo- like pure joy as an adult it's very fleetingly like I say if if at all like but you, but you can get it very reliably through these uh through these substances and that's what's yeah that's why i'm a fan <laughs> yeah and people try with alcohol. I'm not knocking alcohol, but I mean, it's a toxin. It's a poison and it's not an entheogen and it doesn't work with your body. It works against it. But I mean, it's socially acceptable at the end of the day to knock a couple back just so you can go, you know, and just mm-hmm. chill and feel that. But when you can microdose, like I microdose Amanita. I, I heroic dose it from time to time, but mostly just microdosing it. And it's wonderful when it's microdose night because it's like, ah, you know, I can get out of my skin. I can get out of having an attachment to my physical construct and I can get reset to awe and wonder. 
mm -hmm. of everything around me. And it's not even a heroic dose. It's a micro dose. And it's enough of a micro dose to just be like, yeah, this is what it was about. So what does it what does it feel like then? I mean, this, this is kind of, I mean, you mentioned you, you've not done any of the psychedelics, so I, I don't know I, what what can you just sort of like try and describe what does it feel like to be on Amanita? It feels like drinking love, <laughs> like when you when you, when it when it gets in and it feels fills your body, it just feels like love. It feels like communion with all around you in a really beautiful way but not overly just yeah you know just in a microdose mm -hmm. and i microdose i'm at a, every two weeks now that's my maintenance dose and every time i take it it's that it's just this but you get the ibotenic acid depending on how much you decarb it so i'll take it two hours before bed and i'll if i don't decarb it very much then you get that ibotenic acid boost and it's a real upper and you get motivated mm -hmm. and you get creative and I'll write out ideas for videos and sort of get some workflow done and get some stuff done around the house. And I've taken enough ibotenic acid that I wanted to just sort of rebuild the house or maybe paint the house. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, ibotenic acid is a crazy thing. And then it gives way to the muscomol and that's when it just sort of fills you with this sense of completion, connectedness, peace, love, gratitude, 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 yeah. and just wanting to lay back and look at everything around you with a sense of yes, like just yes, yes. I, li I like the way you, you said uh, communion earlier, and you, you sort of reminded me that was one of the words that jumped out of me in one of, one of my ceremonies. and. I can't remember the exact, but it's, it, it, yeah, it's it's a very tricky one to sort of put your finger on, but it, that feeling of like you are in communion with something bigger than yourself and it's this, something, I guess, like ancient and sacred, but yeah, it, it's, it, I, there's no other word for it, but it, you feel it and it's, it's. That's timeless. why, I like, see, I have them on my shelf and that's why, can you see them? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They stay here in my studio on my shelf and I have them in my kitchen and my bedroom because I am i don't just have these entities, but every one of them represents millions of entities. It's the hardest thing to explain, but this one entity has the energy and the beingness of all those that came before it, mm -hmm. that contributed to its DNA or its experience and the animals in its environment and the, the chemistry of the air and all of the shifts in the earth and the humans that have used it and then urinated back into the soil. Like every, it's like this circle and they're all here and it's, it can be loud and overwhelming to be in the presence of that much stuff lack of a better word but it's so great it's so all inspiring to be around them and then when you drink it like you just that you're communing yeah. that's that's all it is they're they're speaking i don't know what they're saying but it's beautiful yeah it's not sort of the language of the unpronounceable sort of thing or yeah the, the sort of yeah it's something you're not meant to understand it and that's fine but it means something yeah it's it's, it's like what we said earlier but you, you're not you kind of you, while you're there you experience it in its fullness and you can't quite bring it back and i don't i don't think we're fully meant to but it's something for us to aspire to to get back to i think that's why we like talking about it so much and we want other people to do it and talk about it because then we don't you don't have to use words you can say hey when you said this I got it, and then mm -hmm. a thousand words are unnecessary. Yeah, you talk. You kind of talk in, in a language of of poetry and feelings because you. That, I think that's that's certainly what I do in my sort of trip reports. You are you are saying things to evoke the feeling of what it was like to be there, not necessarily what exactly happened. Because there's you can't even come close to describing what exactly happened. All you can try and do is evoke through your expressiveness and through through the sort of the language game and you know 
perhaps there's some visuals or something. You're trying to evoke something like what it was like to go through this thing, but not exactly like it. And yeah, fuck knows if you're, you can, <laughs> you can ever, <laughs> ever admit it. It's, and I, I think that's what, what's part of the fun in it is that you're playing a poetry game. You know, you and I right now, we're kind of playing a poetry game of where we kind of, we both know the rules and it's, and we get it, but it's, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's creative and it's, it's fun to talk with stuff like that. And that, I think that's why I, I kind of find it frustrating to try and bake that back into reality. It's not supposed to, the, the, the transcendent is not supposed to be literal fact. It's supposed to be transcendent or something to aspire to. Or, or that, that, that's how I see it anyway. I think it's. Well, uh, and honestly, it makes me start to wonder if, if we hadn't grown up in this society, but we grew up in one that entheogens was just a regular part of everyday life, would you not, if you were using it on a regular basis, then feel more like that's actually reality and this is a distraction? I think from, from what I've seen from when I so when I was in like um, in Peru and in, in, in the jungles and stuff, which it is just baked into the society there. And it it's it's funny, I was I was I was comparing this back to my own life. Like if I if I turned up in work on Monday and said, you know, I, I just got married at the weekend, everyone would pat me on the back and say, Well done, or I could come and say, you know, my ch- my child was born at the weekend and everyone was like, Oh, good job. If I came in and said, do you know, I just had this the most amazing psychedelic experience. It was a game changer. They, I, they would think I'd lost my mind. Now, in the jungle, in these villages, they can have that conversation. That's It's it's baked into culture. So you, you could be having breakfast. You could be having your evening meal. You could be in ceremony. You could be out of ceremony. The, the language game doesn't change because it is just... And even this concept of integration doesn't really exist because... There's no phase where you have to sit there and consciously integrate something because it's happening all the time. It's just, it's part of it. So, you know, we sort of go and and like, you know, day trip into these sort of cultures and experiences and sort of have, have a like dip our toe in the water of these experiences. For them, it's, it's Tuesday. It's just, you know, (laughs) that's what's going on. And there's something about that that's, I mean, like very sort of seductive and like very sort of makes you yearn for that sort of simpler life and that sort of to be part of that culture. Um, But I think it would be easier to live if these are the distractions and using and where you go and what you learn and bring back with you is the reality. mm -hmm. And I think it's what's making me weird because I'm far, I'm starting to feel more normal than I've ever felt mm-hmm. in my own skin, but I am wholly unfit for society at this point. Like I don't just think so. I, mean, um, I don't know. I, I, I think the so. right society I'm finding my tribe. Well, I think it depends on, it, yeah, I, I, you, it's gotta be the right society. I think you gotta have for want of a better term, the kind of like the balls to do it because, and I think and I think you do. You certainly put, that's what you project because if you if you went into some societies, kind of like half-assed and like, oh, I did this, they would crush you. They would just they'd steamroll over you and call you a freak and, and that's them. But there are sort of places where if you if you can sort of stand up and say, this is me and this is what I I'm I'm prepared to go out on this shield and that's that's fine, then. Yeah, you can have a voice, and I think the fact that we, you know, have these little platforms that have sprung up, I think is a is a good. It's one of the reasons why I'm a bit optimistic that because there are people who want to hear this kind of stuff, and the people who want, you know, people like you and I to, to talk about the, about this stuff, and that's that's a positive. I think I think that's a good thing. I think on that hopeful note, I think this would be a good spot to wrap it up because I need to get home and uh, and and, and uh, see see my kids before they go to bed. I just want to say this has been super awesome. I've really enjoyed it. And so, you know, thanks for making time. And I hope we can uh, we'll have to do we it again. Do it again. Soon. Yeah, definitely. It was nice meeting you. And yeah, cool. And I love your channel. And said to you, I'll, I'll be watching. Make that fire pit. I want to see it. Send yeah. me the link. All right. Cool. Amanita, thank you very much. This has been awesome. I'll hopefully speak to you soon.